Hi, good afternoon. This is Devora Enten, and I'm joining you on behalf of Yesh Tikva, uh, an organization that works towards supporting individuals and couples through their infertility experiences. I am joined today by by Bill Petak, who is an expert in male infertility, male factor infertility, and really kind of, after a lot of research, found out that he's one of the very few men who actually are working in this field. So if anybody out there is interested in, in the psychological work and wants to have a practice in five minutes flat, join us in learning more about male infertility. Um, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker and work as a clinical consultant for Yesh Tikva, and I'm so glad that you have um, joined us today. And why don't you give us a little bit more information about yourself and what brings you to our conversation? Sure, I'm glad to. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to join you. Um, I'm a licensed psychologist. I live and practice in Baltimore and, the, and its environs. But I have an office near Annapolis as well, although everything these days is taking place out of my home office. In addition, I'm on the faculty of uh, Thomas Jefferson University, Sidney Kimmel Medical School, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where I am an assistant, uh, an associate clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Beautiful. And I have actually heard you present and speak at the Jefferson Infertility Conference that we luckily got to have a, a bite-sized piece of this year. So I know of your uh, expertise in that area especially as well. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how you got involved in this work? How did this end up being your area of interest And before we jump into the clinical conversation? Sure. So um, it goes back to the mid-80s. I was uh, in private practice here in Baltimore. And my brother-in-law, who, uh, who at the time was training to be a reproductive endocrinologist at Johns Hopkins, uh, he had been at Sinai Hospital as the uh, director of the uh, residency program for a couple of years. He had me in teaching the residency program about human sexuality. And when he went down to Hopkins to do his fellowship, he called me one day and he said, I, uh, I know how to get people pregnant now, but I do not understand the psychological issues involved with infertility. Would you be willing to see some patients for me? And I thought for a minute and I said, all right, well, I do have a background in family therapy and infertility is a family crisis. So sure, I can do that. You'll need to teach me some of the medical issues that are involved, but I think I can handle the psychological issues. So we began that journey back in 19, probably 84, 85, and it has continued ever since then. Um, I found it to be incredibly interesting and very different from um, the other work I've been doing in that I was helping people create families, which was um, by virtue of being Jewish, a very Jewish thing to do. The first commandment being mm -hmm. be fruitful and multiply. Um, and, um, and having uh, created a family myself by that point, uh, I had one child and was uh, about to have another. Um, I thought this was a wonderful thing and I'd want to be able to help people who were doing that. Um, and also I was very interested in the Jewish issues involved um, hmm. because having been raised as a reformed Jew um, and considering myself nominally knowledgeable, um, I, I, I thought that was important to know. Um, and I'm living in a community which is very diverse. There is a, as many people know, there's a very strong uh, Orthodox community here in Baltimore. And a number of um, the leaders in the field, one in particular, had a background in clinical psychology and we became friends. Mm -hmm. um, and because I was teaching at Sinai in their residency program, I got to know fellows who were training, uh, I mean, residents who were training in OBGYN, who had also trained at the local yeshiva. And uh, I developed a relationship with some of them and then when they went into practice, I had an opportunity to consult with their patients and it. It, sort of, it sort of grew from there. Grew from there. Let me ask you, you know, why we talk a lot, it seems like women are a little bit more open and comfortable to some degree talking about issues around emotions for sure, but mm -hmm. also issues around fertility that once they kind of step into this world of fertility challenges or of infertility, they seem to be a little bit more willing to talk. Tell me a little bit about the men's perspective. If we're dealing about, let's talk first about just as a male in a partnership with his wife, trying to conceive, maybe they know what's wrong, maybe they don't know what's wrong, but what is it? A go, what is going on in a man's head when he's well, struggling to conceive and build a family? Well, let me add one thing before I do that, because you know I mentioned I was teaching in an obstetrics and gynecology program, 
And as I became involved with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, their mental health professional group, it became quite clear to me that there are very few men involved in this organization. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, as I got to know more and more about infertility, I became very aware that 40% of infertility is male factor and another 10 or 15% is combined. So you're talking about 50% of infertility involves men. But there were very few mental health providers who were either male or talking about that. So I became very interested in the male side of things. Mm -hmm. And since within the organization, I'm the guy because there aren't a lot of guys, um, right. you know, I got started to get questions and um, started to, to develop some interest. So, so what is it about men? Well, quite obviously, we're different than women. Uh, we're socialized differently. Um, we think about family differently. It, it, I mean, we can go back to biblical, um, you know, and, and look at the, the references there. Um, you know, in the story of Abraham and Sarah, he's not able, they are not able to conceive. It doesn't say anything about him. But it's, it's all placed on her. Um, and so, um, and there's not much from his point of view about what is is going on in his head. But we have an idea about what Sarah's thinking. She knows that family is important. So she says, why don't you use Hagar, um, the first surrogate gestational carrier, and, um, and have a child with her? And then later on, we see that she becomes jealous of that relationship. She desperately wants a child of her own. Um, and, and we all know the story, Hagar and Ishmael leave. Um, Sarah conceives, uh, it's considered a miracle. Um, so, and, and other stories uh, within the Bible are, are, it's quite obvious that the women's point of view is well expressed, but the men, we don't have a, a clue about what's going on in their heads, except in the story of Elkanah, uh, where he says to his wife, uh, am I not more dear to you than 10 sons, or yes. I, I may be yes. quoting the number wrong, but, but a misunderstanding uh, of, uh, you know, it's important to him, but already he's got another wife and he's got kids with her. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't get this male's view of what's going on. Is it because men don't talk much? Is it because men don't talk much about this? Is it because conception and gestation take place within a woman's body and a man is necessary, but it's a very brief interlude. Whereas for the woman, it's nine months and he's an observer. Um, mm -hmm. Unclear, mm -hmm. um, but we know, but we know that men and women are socialized differently. Right. So what do you, what are you hearing from the men when they know that they are beginning this process of infertility? What are you hearing from them? If they actually showed up in your office in the beginning, maybe I'm just here to support my wife, but if you actually get into the weeds with them, what are they expressing to you? Well, if you actually get into the weeds with them, I think men are just as concerned as women are about having family. And when there's a problem, they're just as concerned as their partners, as their wives are. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is that there are some gender roles, if you will, which have been placed on both men and women. And one of the gender roles and expectations on men is that we will be strong. Mm -hmm. And as a result of being strong, we're not supposed to express how we feel because feelings can, you know, if you look at the traditional literature, feelings are just about what's wrong, not about what's right. Although, you know, there's a half of the feeling spectrum, which is happiness and joy and, and, and those sorts of things. But when we talk therapeutically about how do you feel, it's we're, what, we're in, what we're looking for is what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's, and so guys are not socialized to talk about what's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, men, men do not talk about in general. And of course, this is a big generalization. Many men do not talk about how they feel um, unless it is, you know, with the closest of closest friends uh, and the most intimate of relationships where you bear your soul. And that happens very rarely. Right. Uh, but, but women are much more able to do that. Do you feel, do you hear a lot of your, one of the things I hear most from the men that I work with is about, like, I'm here to support my spouse. Like, I'm here to support my wife and whatever. Mm -hmm. And if I share with her that I'm sad or anxious or disappointed, that I'm almost like layering my sadness on her. And that's not fair to her. It's not fair to her. And my job is to be strong for her. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to women, as I know you know, 
they are not looking for strength all of the time. They're looking for a more well-rounded individual. It's okay to be sad about not being able to conceive, whether it is male factor or female factor. That's perfectly fine. It, it, in fact, that's a stronger position because it shows the depth of your feeling and the, the, the well-roundedness of you as a human being, um, and I think is well appreciated. But we are socialized differently, and our belief is that we have to be the strong oaks, the sturdy oaks, always available and, and, right. never, and never weak, whatever right. that means. So do you challenge that when you're working with the men? Do you talk to them about strategies to be more vulnerable with their wives so that there is this space of connection that she might be seeking? Or do you, I mean, how much do you challenge that gender role? Oh, uh, absolutely. I'll, ch I'll challenge that. Um, that's um, one of the things I talk about is that there are many different ways to show strength. Uh, one of them is to show the range of feelings that you have. Um, and I do the feelings are not all bad. Feelings are positive as well as negative. Um, uh, certainly when you have a child, you will be exceedingly happy um, and you will share that with your spouse. Um, and it's no in my view, not a problem. Depend, you know, if you walk in and you're weeping all of the time, that's going to be difficult for her, unless that's the kind of guy you've been with her all along, and she's mm -hmm. grown to know and appreciate that. Um, but that's yeah, I will challenge guys. Challenge that. So let me ask you, like on a practical level, if there was somebody listening to this conversation and he and his wife are going through infertility treatments or approaching infertility treatments, what might be the one way to challenge that gender role for him? What might be the one tip that you would give him to like breach that divide? Uh, that's a very good question. I I don't know that I'd come up with a you know a, a number one tip, but um, I I certainly would say in all likelihood, your wife will appreciate a wider range of emotion from you about this. Um, it's okay to be afraid of certain things or scared or, or anxious about things. Maybe anxious is where I would start. Mm -hmm. Try to use, with men, I try to use male language. Uh, afraid is probably not a good word, hmm. but anxious or concerned. Concerned is a good word because uh, we're more comfortable with being concerned. We're concerned about if we're in business, how the business is going to do. Uh, we're concerned about if we're farmers, how the weather is going to be and how it will affect crops. We're concerned about our children having the best teachers so that they can progress as, as well as possible. Concern's a good word. So I would start along those kinds of lines. Mm -hmm. um, and that and it, and it, she will appreciate your concerns. I'll probably do this with him alone, not with her in the room. Right, right. right. Um, that makes sense because I, I don't want to embarrass either of them right, um, right. in front of the other. Right. So using the language that they might feel a little bit more secure with mm -hmm. and then helping them kind of create that connection with their wife. Cause I definitely feel like that's one of the things that I hear the most is like, I don't even know if he cares. Like, I don't even know that he's I, I, really, I hear very often this idea of like, I don't know if he's sad. Like I'm so sad that the cycle failed. I'm so sad that we had a miscarriage. I don't even know if he, he doesn't just seem to express anything. And I really want him to connect with me in this space of grief and sadness. And maybe it's about finding the languaging or the words that he can express to her, those, those forms of connection. I think that, and, and also knowing that other men have done things like that, that, that mm. is a, that is, you know, we are, um, we are likely to do things which we know our peers have done when it comes like to these kinds of, uh, qualities. Uh -huh. uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful series of videos from England um, that shows men, it, it has to do with recurrent uh, pregnancy loss uh, and miscarriage. And it shows a number of men being interviewed uh, about how they felt about the situation that they were in, showing a wide range of emotion. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, and there, there are other few and far between um, indices of this. Uh, there's yeah. a country and Western singer by the name of David Nail, who had terrible time conceiving with him and his wife. And they, he actually wrote an album um, called uh, Fighter. I think that's the title. I'm probably blanking on it right now. But okay. he does a little video with his wife mm -hmm. talking about how difficult it was for them to conceive. And he doesn't quite come out and say, and it was all male factor. Mm -hmm. But he alludes 
in a very, and it's, it's, it's beautiful because he can't come right out and say it, sure. um, but, but he alludes to it, you know, and there, right. there's a, and Gordon Ramsay, the cook um, also had difficulty with conception. Really? He's talked about that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but again, we don't know about this because the wider uh, popular media doesn't cover it very well. Wow. So that's a great way for us to kind of segue into the male factor in fertility questions um, or kind of conversation around that. But just to kind of close out that previous conversation, that idea of finding a mentor or somebody who you can model the way that you would want or need to connect to your wife in a more effective way, but yes. taking taking cues from others or or if it needs to be experts, but at least from other men that say, though this is what worked for me, and maybe kind of copying some of that. It's an interesting idea of modeling that after others. Right. So in terms of male factor and fertility, and to clarify for, so that for some of you who may not be familiar, so we are differentiating between a, a couple who are struggling with infertility, that it may be the issue with the wife, it may be the issue of the two of them together, or we don't know what is officially wrong. And then we'll have this other approximately 50% of the population that is male factor, which means that there's something in the men usually sperm related, um, potentially genetics or potentially sperm quality uh, that impacts fertility. And so that would be called male factor in fertility. And sometimes women also have, the, her, his partner may have an issue. And sometimes she actually seems completely fine and healthy. And yet they're still, their attempt at conception is going to be much more complicated. So tell me a little bit of when you are talking to somebody who's coping with male factor infertility, is there more of like an identity crisis with them as who am I if I cannot produce a child in this sure. way? Oh, absolutely. I will. And I think it, it's, it's, it's bimodal. I mean, you know, that women are, it's an identity crisis as well. Um, our male identity is a little bit different with, with regard to reproduction and female identity. Um, but that's another conversation, which we can have later if you want. But um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, what are we supposed to do? We're, we're, we believe we are um, supposed to grow up, get an education, meet the person we're going to be married to and have children and create the next generation. And that's sort of automatic. And when it's not happening and the diagnosis comes back and it's either something wrong with your uh, delivery system, how the sperm gets to the egg or with the quality or quantity of the sperm, that's devastating. In the same way, it's devastating if you're not producing eggs or if there's something wrong with the, the way they're, they're, the eggs can't get to where they need to be to be fertilized. It's, it's, it's devastating because it's a personal failure over which you have no control. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse if you did something which caused the situation to be such. Now, mm -hmm. Often it's not, I went out and did something, but you had an accident. Um, you uh, worked in an area in which you were exposed to something that was toxic. Um, those sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, today, especially today, laptop computers are really not designed to sit on your lap because if they do and you're a man, you're going to raise the temperature of your lap and testicular temperature needs to be below body temperature because sperm generation mm. requires a lower body temperature. But if you don't know that, and we get lousy information yeah, I was going to say. Mm -hmm. About reproductive health. Um, mm -hmm. You know, women, uh, because of a monthly cycle, are very attuned to reproductive uh, qualities and learn about it at a young age. Um, guys, not so much. And women, because if they're taking good care of their reproductive health, are seeing somebody on a yearly basis for that care. They're, again, acutely aware of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The only reason a guy goes to a urologist if he's got something really wrong with him. Mm -hmm. But a woman goes to a gynecologist not because something is wrong, but it's because she wants to maintain health. Right, right, right. So there's oh. this very, very wide discrepancy in the kind of care we get and therefore the kind of education we get about reproduction. Interesting. And then compounding that with, we don't talk about our feelings all that much in the same way that perhaps women are more comfortable doing. It's this like storm of yes. 
of complication. And a, per so a perfect storm. Perfect storm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you were talking to the women who might be listening, who's who know that they're coping with male factor infertility, what might be some of your what would be your like again that top message that you want to remind them about in a way that what would be the supportive way or the best way to communicate with their spouses in a supportive space, either in terms of what this the husband might need or even in terms of what they themselves might need in that space, because I think it creates, it's conflict. Sure. I, I agree. I think, I think the first and overriding message is this is usually nobody's fault. So mm -hmm. blame is not a terribly useful concept. And we're both going through something which is incredibly distressing for both of us. I mean, it's not a contest to see who's the most distressed. Um, and, and the other part, and I think this is important for both men and women to understand is that not everybody feels the same way at the same time all of the time. So you know, it's uh, like competing sine waves, if you, if you will, where one is down and the other is not so down, or one is actually hopeful and up because there's some treatment that they're discussing and the other one is not quite in the same place. Um, that doesn't mean you don't care. It just means you're in a different place at the same time. And that's because people are different. That's going to happen. I guess the other thing is, and that, and it's important to think about this, if, if you are grieving a loss, um, we don't all grieve in the same way. Yeah. And there's sort of this westernized notion that the way people grieve appropriately is to be sad and tearful and weepy. And that works great if that's how you grieve. But some right. people grieve by throwing themselves into work. Some people grieve by being silent. Mm -hmm. Some people grieve by trying to find ways to pull themselves out. You know, guys, right. typi guys typically tend to be problem solvers. Right. That's, that's what we do. All right, here's the problem. Now I got to go come up with a solution. And I'm not yeah. going to talk about it so much. Women are much better at talking through ideas with their friends and sort of getting the mirror image, you know, back, you know, how do you, yeah, that's how I feel and so on and so forth. Guys don't do that so much. Right. Right. I've definitely seen also a high level of irritability as a form of their grief. Uh, you know, sometimes yes. we'll see the man go into the man cave, like that he's just totally distracted by the things that pull him away from those feelings. But yes. that irritability is something that I notice more and more of that heightened like agitation and irritability that can really convey that message of I'm grieving or I'm also sad. I just don't necessarily have the words to put with it. So, yeah, we, we have we have work to do in yep. terms of the communication. Yeah, I got Guys, guys, guys. Oh, well, we, we all do. Guys, guys tend to avoid and deny. You know, those are, those are great coping strategies, um, but they're not great coping strategies. You know, right. they're, 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 right. they work, but they don't work, right? right? And it's always important, I think, for both sides of that male-female equation to understand that the other person isn't going to be a mirror image of you is going to be different. That's not bad. It's mm -hmm. just different. The reason right. you got married was because you were different. You wouldn't right. want to marry a clone of yourself. It would be incredibly boring. Right. Well, I love it. I think that's a great note to end on, that idea of appreciating the differences, even in the grief, even in the challenges of a fertility um, treatment and the process that you have to go through, that if we can recognize and acknowledge the differences, um, continue to learn some of those things by, by talking about that. I think that we're in a, in a good place. 